So we are live now, and yeah, we'll just kind of hang out here for a little bit, wait for uh, numbers to start going up, and then I'll do an intro in a couple of minutes. Are we muted right now? No, but you can be if you want to be. Just want to say good morning to everyone who's joining us. Uh, it's just going to be a couple more minutes. We're going to let uh, the rest of the folks join us, and then we'll get underway. All right, if you're just joining us, welcome. Thanks for joining us. We're just waiting a couple, we're waiting just a moment to let everyone join in and then we'll get started shortly. So thanks for joining us. Well, I can sort of do a quick intro for the folks that are here now, and then I'll let you get going. Uh, sure. So thanks. I know people are kind of still trickling in, um, but but thanks everybody for being here, right at the top. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a good one. So uh, this is our fourth day of lead up classes for Filmscape 2020. Really excited to to be offering this class this year. Uh, Abelson has been been good to us uh, in, in their class offerings for, for a couple of years now, and I'm excited to, to have this, this together for us. So yeah, folks who are coming in, uh, there's a Q&A section in, the, in your screen below. So as the class is going, if you've got any questions, if you've got stuff you wanna follow up on, uh, there are some moderators that'll be answering stuff as we go, and then there will be moments uh, where, where Ian will answer some questions as well, which is a transition for me to introduce Ian from Able City LA, uh, who's gonna be the instructor today. So I don't matter, so I'm gonna go away, but Ian, you uh, or do your thing. <laughs> good morning, everyone, and, and good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and today we're gonna spend some time looking at different types of wireless systems. Assisting me today is Nicholas Samara, who works with me at Able City in Burbank, California, and Jeff Smith, who works in our Able City Brooklyn office. So uh, I will be doing the instructing. I'm gonna be showing you how these systems interface with different cameras. So today we're gonna look at Alexa Mini LF, and we're gonna look at a classic Alexa. And I gotta chose those for reasons I'll get into uh, as we get further into this. So we're gonna look at Airy systems, we're gonna look at the Preston system, and we're also going to look at uh, Bolt uh, transmitters and receivers. As I mentioned, Jeff and Nick are going to be moderating. So if you have a question, please use the uh, chat box for that, uh, and they will get back to you ASAP. The way that we're gonna run this class is that uh, because Nick and Jeff are both instructors and we all collectively have worked or are working uh, in, on productions, we come to these sessions from different perspectives, different points of view. So occasionally they, may, they might chime in and uh, offer uh, some wisdom of their own. Uh, but with that said, let's get started. So I have intentionally uh, kept the Alexa LF that I have here I haven't built it up yet because there's a couple of things that I want to discuss about how we're going to build this package and have it work with the WCU4 handset. 
First and foremost, uh, the Alexa Mini LF is the latest addition to the Airy line. It is their 4K uh, large format sensor. And one of the uh, interesting things that was developed with this was the new uh, LPL mount. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, bear with me. I want to give you the best visual experience you can have today uh, in the confines of what we're doing on Zoom. With that being said, I'm going to be changing signals a lot today so that uh, I can give you the best uh, possible perspective on things um, that I'll be mentioning. So uh, the only reason I mention that is that occasionally I'm going to go to my phone or something like that. So I'm going to take that occasion right now to do that. So bear with me. Because what I want to do is I want to show you the LPL mount. And specifically, I want to show you how that interfaces with uh, the lens that we're going to use today because we're going to be using a signature prime. And the signature prime is Aries lens that comes in the native LPL mount. And the other thing that's really interesting about it is because it was developed by Aerie and designed by Aerie, uh, it has some amenities built into it that allow us to get a lot more out of this camera and out of their lenses than we have typically in the past. Let me uh, change signals here so you can take a look. All right, so here is the LPL mount. If you're not familiar with this, it's an interesting design because here was the challenge that they had when they designed this. They had to be able to uh, accommodate PL mount lenses and the new LPL lenses. I'm going to take or loosen the wings for the LPL, that's the blue wings here. When I pull this out, I'm actually pulling the LPL mount out of the camera. And the reason I wanted to show you this is twofold. First of all, you can see that it is a dramatically bigger diameter than the traditional PL mount. But also I want you to pay attention to this right here. These are the connections that are used for LDS or lens data system. That is integral to its operating with the WCU4 because what is happening is the data that is generated by the signature prime is now being transported back to the camera and then transmitted to the handset. So if we use signature primes, uh, we essentially already have data streaming in real time to our handset. I'm going to back this up just a hair because I want to show you this is the signature prime. Let me pan over just a hair so it's just a little better. And you can see, first of all, notice just how big that back element is. It's enormous and it, it allows us to have that really high quality image onto the sensor. Uh, absolutely beautiful lenses. If you haven't had an opportunity to, uh, to look at these, I uh, really encourage you to look at footage online, but if you have the uh, ability to see them in person, they're really, really beautiful lenses. But specifically what we want to pay attention to are these little connectors right here. Those are the data points or the point of connection that allow that data to go back to our handset. So I'm going to go ahead and put this lens on to the camera and I'll switch angles so you can see this a little better. Okay. And while we're here, let me just pan this over so you can see. So we have our marks here for our iris and for our focus. And then right here, we have something called an L bus connector. I'm going to get into that in just a moment, uh, what L buses are for, but the short answer to that is that it is a four pin connector and it is allowing us to not only send power to our focus and our iris motor today, it's also going to send the data back to the camera. And while we're here, I also want to take note, see if I can bring my camera up just a hair more so you can see this a little better. On the LF, we have a cage that is part of the Airy uh, professional accessories line. And so this cage was made specifically for the mini LF. They of course make them for 
all their cameras. As a matter of fact, they make accessories for a whole bunch of different cameras. You can check that out online at the ARI website. But I want to mention this specifically because I want to talk about how we're going to build the camera or build the motors onto the camera. Now with this build at the base of the camera, I could go in here and there is the possibility down here for 19 millimeter studio rods. So if you look right here, this is where our 19 millimeter studio rods would go in. And the interesting thing about this design is that we also have this shoulder pad here and the whole thing slides off a dovetail. So we could go from uh, sort of a studio setup, slide off and go right into a handheld setup. So it's very versatile, very handy. However, today, what I want to do is I want to utilize uh, another option on here, and that is right up here where it says Airy. I have the ability to put a 19 millimeter rod. Now, the beauty of that is that now this gives me a mounting point for the motors, and uh, it will be out of the way of the of this area down here, and maybe I want to utilize that area for hand grips or other handheld accessories, which have you. But having them up here, having the motors come off the 19 millimeter rod up here, allows for this to be a very clean and quick install. As a matter of fact, uh, I have this pre-built, so I literally can put this right in. And the build was that fast. The only step I have left to do is to plug the L bus connector. Oh, it's a little hard to see. We're gonna take a look at the motor in detail in just a second. I'm gonna take the L bus and I'm gonna, the L bus has a little red dot here. It's probably hard to see with this camera, but the red dot is your registration point for the keyway with the L bus connector. I want it to be facing towards me and then we're good to go. So I'm gonna go back to another view here. So you can see this, one second please. All right, let me lower this. And there you have it. So we have the LBUS connector and we have are two motors, one for our focus, one for iris. And I'm gonna reset this just ever so slightly. Okay, I just wanna make sure they were lining up. Great. Okay, so we're all set there. Let's take a moment and let's take a look at the motor itself before we start the functionality of it. So I'm gonna change angles yet again on you guys. And let's go here. All right, so here is the motor that we are using with the WCU4. It is called a C Force Mini. Now, there are two different types of C Force Mini motors uh, out in the world now. This is what you could refer to as the hardwired version. There's also a uh, C Force Mini RF. The C Force Mini RF. Uh, the easiest way to detect it is it has a little antenna here. And instead of this area right here, it has a little LED window and a button below it. And that is our access port to going in and changing various parameters on it. The nice thing about that is that we can use that RF motor uh, without an airy camera or uh, we can isolate it just by itself. So let's think about a use purpose for that maybe we would want to have just the iris isolated uh, so that a DIT could control it or something of that nature. Let's take a look at the motor here, how it's designed and how it's going to work. Pretty straightforward, uh, incredibly uh, small profile and um, really simple to use. We'll start from the back and we have a little wing, wing nut that will loosen and it's hinged. So when I bring it back, it slides up. So the great thing about that is it can't drop off, can't fall out of the socket. It just swings up and the arm comes out. Right now I have it with its 15 millimeter 
spacer installed for 15 millimeter support rods. So that could be a lightweight rod uh, setup, for example. If I take that out, the default is 19 millimeter. That's what we're gonna be using today. When this is loose, this carriage slides up and down in this track right here. And it allows me two axis of adjustment. First of all, it allows me to move up and down on a lens so that I can get that motor as centered as possible to the uh, lens itself. And it also gives me the ability to swing this in and out away from a motor. Just a little side note. Uh, generally speaking, these kits come with a little uh, bag of cables and accessories and whatnot. Uh, best practice for this little guy, put it back in your kit bag so you don't lose track of it. Little, little side note there. Okay, on the underneath here, here are your L bus connectors. As I mentioned, these are twofold purpose. First of all, they're supplying the power from the camera to the motor. And secondly, they're also communicating information about the axes that they're on. And the, those axes are defined by this panel up here. So notice it says FIS, so it's focus, iris, zoom. Uh, the very common nomenclature that we use to describe uh, the, the functionality of these wireless systems is FIS, just an abbreviation for focus, iris, and zoom. So when I power this up, the first thing that I need to do is I need to determine what the function of this motor will be or what axis will this motor be functioning on. And the way that that is changed and the way that you verify the function of that is that when this motor is powered up, you simply got to push one time on that button right here. And what will happen is one of these three letters will illuminate. So if it's illuminated on F, it means it's now designated as focus, iris, or zoom. And that's really the first thing you want to do when you get everything built on your camera, because you want to make sure that uh, you, know, you, you have the right axes functioning with the control. The top here, this is where our motor is. And hopefully you can see right up here. There you go, it says M0.8. And that is a designation that is an industry standard size. Another way of expressing that pitch of those teeth is called 32 pitch. That 32 pitch has been an industry standard uh, for film cinema lenses for, for ages. And uh, it is an industry standard. Everybody must conform to this. So all lens, cinema lens manufacturers and all lens accessory manufacturers must conform to this pitch and this tooth count uh, on on these uh, on these gears. There is a large flathead in the center here, and this is integral to the flexibility of how we're going to build uh, these motors onto different lenses and camera builds. I'm going to go into profile here, and as you can see, you can have that motor either on this side, or if I loosen it using the flathead right here. I can move the gear over to this side. And if I look, go into profile here, you can kind of see that it has these teeth that it's going to intersect with. And uh, you want to make sure that uh, this is nice and flush. When you're starting to use this for the first time, it's sometimes uh, you may encounter this situation where you may think it's flush, uh, but then when you go to calibrate, uh, you'll notice there might be some air gap like between here and here. So when you see that, just make sure it goes nice and flush like you see here, and then you should be all good to go. So it's pretty straightforward in its design. So let's turn on, I'm gonna power up the camera and we can see the status of the motors. Now keep in mind, this camera is not powered up right now. Let me pan this just a little bit so you can see a little better. So we're gonna power up the camera and put this to the side. And here's our WCU4 hand unit. Now notice this unit is not powered up right now. So notice what's happening over on the camera side. Nothing is happening on the camera side or the motors are flashing. So this flashing sequence, which is green and red, is stating I don't see a signal from my handset. So 
the camera is awaiting a response from the handset. Before I do that, I just want to, I'm gonna push these buttons and you can see that the eye has lit, lit up on this. So this is our iris motor and I'm pressing this one and focus lights up on that one. Okay, so I know that our, uh, our functionality is right. And also notice on the motor that you have two L buses. And this is really important because what this allows us to do is to link or daisy chain, you could say, a series of motors together. So by choosing that functionality, it now discreetly knows what its function is, but it allows the pass through of information of other motors through this motor as well and then into the camera. So you can see on the top here, I have this L bus coming from the camera. Oops, sorry about that. The camera does not like it when I do that. There you go. <laughs> okay, so I have this one coming from the camera that I'm jumping from this motor to this motor. There are a whole series of different lengths of those cables, uh, just so you know. Uh, and I wanna show you very quickly um, a little chart here, because I think it's important to understand that, you know, wireless is great, but as a professional, you want to always make sure that you have some type of backup. And so, this could be caused by excessive RF. Uh, it could be caused by any number of situations. Generally speaking, I, I haven't run into issues with WCU4s on set and conflicting with other frequencies. How that being said, as a camera assistant, you always want to have some type of backup just in case. So what I'm showing you here is the array of different cables and combinations that would be used to go into uh, the different Alexa Mini, Mini LF, uh, that is going to use something called a LCS cable. And then the extension to LCS, which is an adapter uh, that will adapt to these different types of Alexas. So LCS is the connector that's going to be uh, plugged into the back of the um, handset. And that connector is located right there. So that would be your hardware connection. Just so you have this uh, kind of in mind. And it's important to note that because the system uh, has so many options, that you want to make sure you have the proper cabling uh, in order to make that combination possible. Uh, if you want to reference this in the future, you can always go onto the ARI website. And if you go to the WCU4 page, uh, at the bottom of that page, they have a diagram and an explanation of each of these cables and how they're going to interface with your particular camera build. Because keep in mind that the, this one control works with every generation of Alexa, and Alexa is now 10 years old. Hi, Ian. Yes. Hi, it's Jeff. Um, Hi, Jeff. One of the moderators. Hi. So we had a, a question from the audience um, about the frequency range that the C-Force Mini motors use, and has it ever had interference from, say, like wireless lavaliers or other wireless components on set? I can only speak for the situations that I've been in on set, and I have not had those uh, problems uh, caused by that. I've had uh, I've had other things on set cause some frequency uh, situations with mics, but not with the WCU4. Again, I can't say definitively, but I can only speak to the situations where I've used it on set and I have not had that inter that that uh, conflict with wireless microphones or other wireless accessories, I should say. Yeah, that's been my experience as well. It's like the motors always seem to be very, very solid in talking to the WCU4. Yeah, um, you know, and this is something we'll, we'll, we'll touch on in a little bit as well. But, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is these units only get better with time because ARI listens very carefully to their customers and there are firmware updates pretty regularly for these items and their supported accessories. And they try to address 
uh, and come up with strategies to try to address things like that as best they can. And if okay. I can chime in a little bit as well, this is Nick, the other moderator. Uh, generally speaking, for most audio equipment, that's going to be in licensed band, meaning that there really shouldn't ever be anything also in that same frequency range. Uh, these uh, wireless focus units don't use those same licensed band uh, kind of uh, broadband frequency ranges. So um, generally, they should <coughs> excuse me. Generally, they shouldn't walk on each other. Thanks, Nick. Okay, so I wanted to, so now that we have our status and we know that hey, it's it's blinking green and red. So that means it just simply doesn't see the handset yet. So let's go ahead and power up the handset. And this little four right there is indicating that we are on channel four. And the fact that I'm getting these bars next to it is indicating that we have a good strong signal. Also look that our motors have now gone from that flashing status to a, uh, green and let's say amber or yellow status flashing. So now that's saying, okay, so the flashing sequences you need to know are green and red is, I just don't see a handset for communication. The yellow or amber and green flashing means um, this needs to be calibrated. Okay, so let's go ahead and notice that we're getting an alert here. Let's calibrate our motors. I'm gonna push the button. And now it's going to start that process. And, aha, okay, I'm actually happy this is doing it. So what happened was the motor for the focus wasn't fully engaged. So let me go ahead and redo that. Ian, while you're doing that, I'm going to jump in real quick because yeah. we had another question in the chat. Um, yeah, sure. We have a, a lighting op who is asking if there's a way that they can ensure that the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz band uh, devices that they tend to use, especially for things like wireless DMX, if there's anything they can do to configure those to help ensure that they don't cause any problems or interference with wireless units like these. I, again, we have uh, airy lighting in our building. Uh, and we use these around them all the time. And we are on a DMX configuration. I haven't had any conflicts. That is one nice thing about using uh, all airy gear, especially, uh, is that obviously being the same manufacturer, they're quite aware of where the frequency bands are within their different products. So if you have um, the Aries version of the Lumen Radio gear plus uh, WCU4, uh, or even their wireless video system they have, there really shouldn't be any conflicts. Um, generally speaking, uh, my experience using these in the field is that with their automatic frequency hopping capabilities, there's usually not anything that anyone else needs to configure around it. Um, they generally tend to do just fine unless the area is extremely saturated with Wi-Fi signal. You'll see that sometimes at the trade shows. You know, you know if that, that starts to ever become a thing again where people are gathering in large groups in a space with all this equipment, then uh, you may have to change channels periodically to avoid interference. But that's something that's handled on the uh, focus puller side, not so much on the lighting tech side. All right, thank you, Nick. So as you can see, uh, this is one of the really uh, nice things about using a Signature Prime with the Alexa LF Mini. All that data from the lens has now been transferred onto my handset. And you can see that as soon as I calibrate the motors, I now have the same settings. So I have three feet here on my scale. I have three feet, three feet. So I have verification and everything is sunk up and it as it should be. Also, uh, so let's just do a little walk around uh, the handset here and get a little more familiar with it. So we, we did speak about the connector here for hard wiring, LCS connector. Then you have this little button right here. This is a trigger that allows us to uh, do settings and also uh, it can be a zap button and the zap button refers to the functionality. Now one of the nice things about this handset is that all three axes uh, are built into this. I mean it can, I don't have to use them all but they're all here. So this little lever right here, this is for my zoom control. Now obviously I'm not going to have zoom on a prime but if I did have a zoom motor it would be activated from this and this is a sort of like a joystick. In other words, the more I push up on it, the faster 
uh, it would go until it reached its maximum zoom speed uh, and allows me to have that functionality. Here I have my slider. And you can see that the slider is with my iris. Now, notice, see I like to, I like to have it oriented this way. I could change that orientation. I'll show you how to do that. But I like to think about closing down on a lens or opening up on a lens. The other thing that happens is notice as I change the T-stop, you're going to see your depth of field or your depth of focus start to increase, right? Because the smaller the iris I have on the lens, the deeper the range of acceptable focus I'm going to have. So it gives you a graphic display of where you're going to be uh, on a given lens. And notice that it also is telling us right here that we are on a 47 millimeter lens. You have soft keys at the top and the bottom that open up different functionality. Right up here, you have a record button. If I hit the record button, I get a tally confidence up here. I'm also gonna get a record indicator here as well. This of course was our main power button right here. Uh, before I go into the functionality on these, I want to show you uh, one thing, which is kind of a couple of things that are kind of important to know about. Let me go into the menu first. I'm gonna go down to the very bottom. So you can see as soon as I hit the menu button, now at the top I have home or back, and then at the bottom I have select and down. So I'm gonna go down to the very bottom on this. And I'm gonna to go to something called system info and I'm going to select. And this is really important stuff here because this is showing me the latest firmware build on this, um, on this handset. And the firmware updates are, are just like firmware updates for the ARRI cameras. And you wanna have this uh, loaded to the most uh, recent version. And to do that, you would go up here to, let's go back one, and let's go up, and we go to the update. Firmware updates are downloads from the ARRI website, and the way that those are uh, brought into the handset is through this little flap down here. There is a little SD card in there. The SD card has to be formatted in FAT32, you can also take FAT16, but FAT32, which means just uh, uh, going in like on disk utility, for example, and designate it, not airy journaled. You wanna do the uh, FAT32, and that will then allow it to uh, go in, allow the firmware to go into the uh, base or root menu of that card, and then you go in here and hit the update. Um, wanna have a fully charged battery when you have it in there, Generally speaking, these updates do not take a lot of time, but it's always best practices to have a, a fully charged battery in there so you don't uh, brick the unit. Uh, the other thing that I want to uh, go in and check is to see if it has a license installed that allows me to do camera functions. Now, this is one thing that's kind of important to note about the uh, WCU4. Uh, let me put this up on screen so you can see this for a second. I want to show you just a slide real quick so we can see this. This is important to note because to get the full functionality uh, in terms of camera control out of your handset, you're going to want to have the remote license installed. And that's the address for it. And that allows you just a little highlight here of what that functionality gives you. Okay. The reason I bring that up is because let's go back into the camera or the camera screen, I should say. And you're going to notice if I hit camera, you can go in here and it's going to give you a synopsis of what the settings in the uh, camera are. So you can see with my frame rate, my shutter angle, exposure index white balance, uh, battery status, and uh, record time. It's also showing me the codec that I'm recording in. And 
notice again the metadata that is being passed through is telling me that I have a signature prime, 47 millimeter, a T18. And all this information, by the way, because of LDS is being transferred uh, through the camera also is metadata that can be stored in our recordings. And that's very helpful for visual effects folks and um, anybody that, that wishes to uh, use that metadata in their post activities. So if I have the license installed, I should be able to go into uh, the setup and now I can go further in here and the beauty of this is that now I can go in, I can select something. And for instance, I can, from the camera or from the handset, now I can be changing frame rate, for example. Shutter angle, exposure index, uh, all those types of utilities that are very helpful, especially if the camera is on a steady cam or it's on a, a gimbal uh, or a jib, a remote uh, access, which would be difficult. Uh, is accessible through here. So it's kind of, uh, it, it's uh, having that functionality is pretty, uh, pretty important in my opinion. You also have access here to your files or your clips. So if I hit play, you can now go into the clips list and you can see that now we have, I've had four, four shots that have been recorded uh, on this card or on my media so far, and I could select them. It has the traditional ARRI identification for reel and clip number. And, uh, you know, all that metadata is there just like you would find on the camera. You are able to select these and play them. However, you will not get them. Here's your play button right here. You will not get a playback on the screen. Uh, you would get your playback on the uh, monitor or in the viewfinder of the uh, of your uh, camera. Okay, let's talk about the main menu here. We're kind of, this is kind of a cheat in a way because everything we need to do has already been done for us. So let's go a little further into this functionality on this home screen as it were. Then we'll go a little deeper into some of the menus. If I go into, first of all, notice I have iris access and I have focus access because as you can see, I have two motors. And notice because I don't have that third uh, axis, the zoom axis available, you just have a little X there. Let's go into the focus menu so we can see what's going on in there. So notice as soon as I do that, it defaults to another, another uh, layer of menus. And We'll start down here and work across. So you have something called a limit. Uh, this limit is referring to the motor. So let's take this, let's take a situation where, let's start at three feet. I'm gonna push in on the limit button. Notice you get the flashing yellow icon or, or blue icon. And I'm gonna, oops, let me clear it. Go a little too fast. Okay, let's go to three feet. So, so let me explain what's about to happen. When you hit the limit button, it is now limiting the travel of the motor. In order for the uh, lens to know what or what the motor to do, it needs to have this push down as you make the uh, adjustment. So I'm gonna push down, go from three feet to five feet. and I'm gonna let go. So now, notice that what's happened is that my scale has been expanded. I still end up at three feet, but the scale of the motor has been limited between three and five feet. Also notice what happens when I get to three feet on the motor, it stops. So where would this be of help? Anytime we're in a controlled situation, let's say uh, some type of motorized or mechanized camera move where it's a predictable uh, movement every time, there's no variation. Uh, this can be a fantastic uh, means of getting accurate focus. We're doing some type of lockdown controlled shooting environment. 
that can be very helpful. Also, you know, here's the other part of that conversation is that if we have the limit on the motor, we now have, you know, the thing about this, the thing about the signature prime that we're looking at is that it has been, or the scale has been designed in such a way that we have lots of marks here for our different focus, right? But what if we're using a lens that doesn't have so many focus marks and we need to expand that because our actor is gonna be moving within a confined set of marks. This helps us to get that focus a little more accurately and a, uh, a little more precisely, arguably. So that's what the limit does. And if I want to disengage the limit, I simply have to push and notice that we go back into our uh, regular scale here. The next control next to it is something called K-LIM. That stands for knob limit. The best way to describe this, and we're going to uh, do the same thing that we did before. In other words, we have to push down on it and then turn, stop and let go, and then it will um, engage. So what knob limit does is, let's say we are going to get a shot. Let's, let's go back up here. Let's say we're gonna be at 30 feet and we have a car coming towards us and it's a really fast move. And this is, this is the turn of the focus. Uh, we wanna speed that up or limit the focus knob. So I'm gonna to go to 30. Okay, so we go there. Let's just go down to five feet. Okay, now what's happened is I now have the full range of the focus knob, or excuse me, the full range of the focus of the lens, but now I have that rotation isolated to a smaller rotation on the knob of the handset. So essentially, what that does is it allows me to do very fast focus pulls in a faster fashion than I would have with the limit disengaged. So I can really whip through this and do these crazy sort of like if we're doing like whip pans or something like that. Again, to take it off, push one time and now we go back into our standard mode. But keep in mind, this uh, something to keep in mind when we're in this sub menu is that we're concentrating just on the functionality of the focus right now. And as a consequence of that, we no longer have our iris information. So that's sort of one of the giveaways um, that we're in a secondary or a sub menu of the main menu. Next is offset. Now it just so happens that this lens, let's, let's go to three feet and let's take a look and see what we have here. So at three feet, We've got three feet here, metadata, a scale reference, and then we have our hard scale. And notice that they all line up and it's lining up on the lens. So there's no problems here. There may be a situation you get into where the relationship of the focus mark here is in conflict with the physical marker here. If you get into that situation, there could be one of two reasons for that. Um, and I'll, I'll show you another reason in just a second, but let's just say uh, everything is as it should be and yet there seems to be a discrepancy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push down on the offset and notice you get the little indicator. Now notice I move the focus knob, but nothing else turns and the motor doesn't turn. So I'm gonna go back up here and now, so now we're saying four is three. So if I go back to four. Now, where this could be helpful is if you're using older lenses and for some reason, uh, there just seems to be a discrepancy in the alignment of the different marks. Uh, offset is a great way to sort of combat that. Once you take this off, 
again, you go back to your normal. Now, the second reason you may encounter a situation where you get in here and you're doing focus and things just aren't not lining up. Um, there is a, a big difference. Let's say if we're at five feet here. Okay, we've got our five, our five. And let's just say this is at seven feet or or something like that. It just does not make any sense at all because it, everything seems to be working just fine. Next place you want to look is the, uh, the WCU4 has a set of pre-marked calibrated focus rings. And the way that they're identified is by this little box right here. Notice the box says 14 inch and it corresponds to the 14 inch as the minimum focus mark on this scale. So there are a series of scales available for the WCU4 that will accommodate various ranges of minimum focus of different lens manufacturers. And these are all able to pop off. Let me just pop this off here. So you can see it has this uh, little keyway, that little notch right there, and it corresponds to this little locating pin right here. And this way we can make sure that we have everything corresponding. Okay, so now everything lines up. But if it doesn't line up, another place to look is, let's go home, back into our main menu, and let's go to menu, and let's go to pre-marked focus rings. If I select that, you'll notice, hey, look at already, there's a discrepancy here. So let's go and go up, let's set, and now we should be dead on. Chances are, uh, if you're seeing a discrepancy in your focus marks, this is the first place you want to look. Uh, nine times out of 10, it's simply because uh, the focus skills are, are mismatched. Uh, you do have the ability within here, if you wish, you can go in and you could select uh, a blank ring uh, and you could make your own marks if you wanted. But again, you can see the range of the different skills that are available. And generally speaking, when you rent these from rental house, they're gonna give you everything that's in there. Okay, let's go back into focus and check out one more item here. And the one thing we haven't talked about so far is this marker. So marker, as the name implies, puts a marker onto uh, different focus marks. So let's put one at five feet. And it might be a little hard to see, but there is now a red line right there. I can put up to eight marks on here. Uh, yeah, you can see the highlight a little better. Let's go to six feet and put another one. You can put as many as eight marks on this scale. Now, I don't know if you can hear that or not, but it'll give you a little vibration on the handset when you go by those marks. Oh, I got the I got this off the table. Let me put it back on the table. You can probably hear it. Well, when you're holding it in your hand, you really can't you really can't hear it that much. It's more you can feel it in the hand grip itself. So it's just a it's a little way to notice to, to give you a visual if you're looking at your actor, you're looking at marks, or you're looking at the lens. Uh, that little vibration gives you confidence that you're at that focus mark. Again, we can increase or decrease up to eight. And if you decide that there's one particular mark that you don't wanna have anymore, you line up to that mark and you hit remove and now it's gone. Or I can just remove or reset. And if I reset, it's all gone now. All right, so I'm gonna go home. And the same capability that we had with the uh, limits on the focus, we have on the iris here. Again, notice that I have this set up in such a way that I can be uh, closing down or I can open up. It's just the nomenclature that I'm used to seeing. And you can see 
as soon as I activate to a new uh, place, that the corresponding stop is now running on the lens. Again, I really didn't have to do much work here because the signature prime pretty much did all the work for me. But if I wanted to limit, I could set limits. So if you're doing a, say you're going from an interior to an exterior or vice versa, uh, we could set it up just for the limits of the range of the pool. And this way we can be able to time this back and forth uh, to, that corresponds with the camera movement. All right, let's go back. And let's take a look into the main menu. Okay, let me go down here. Now we, we talked about the radio channel. Now the radio channel is the channel that is communicating with the Alexa Mini LF. Now there's a couple different communications going in and out of that camera, by the way. Um, right now what we're doing is we're doing a communication with this, in, with this antenna to the receiver on the LF and that's verifying channel four. What I wanna do is I'm gonna set that there for one second and let me call up something on my phone here. What I wanna show you is uh, different ways, and we're gonna talk about this in different references today. I just wanna show you real quick on my phone that I just got the mini LF 31370. So what I just did was I just Wi-Fi'd into the Mini LF. And now with this address on Safari, I'm now active into the camera. So if I turn this sideways, now I have the connection into the settings. This is another way that I could connect to the camera. But in particular, the reason why I wanted to show you this, and I just swiped uh, to the left is what I could do is I can go down here and I'm gonna to go to something called ECS. If I go into ECS, notice that the radio is telling me it's ready and it's on channel four. So it's telling me that communication between the camera and my handset is now operational. Nine times out of 10, if you can't get a configuration or you just simply can't get a link communication between the camera and the handset, Chances are one of two things has happened. Either this has been turned off, notice there's the power right there, or, and or it could be a couple of things, most likely power has been turned off, or the channel is not correct, or they're not matching. So if you look for those main things, nine times out of 10, uh, that's gonna be where you can troubleshoot. And uh, again, this is a, a really nice interface to have with the camera because you can do this you know, very discreetly uh, over your phone. Also notice that the metadata from the lens is there. And also very unlikely you should have to run into this problem, but if you're a camera assistant or if you're gonna be a camera assistant that's gonna do a lot of traveling internationally, you may wanna go down there and check out your region and see which region you're in. So just to recap how I got into here is I was, I went into the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi was turned on in the camera. It comes with the camera. So I was able to identify that in my settings. And then I went in and on Safari, I went in and I typed in uh, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash mini dash LF dash 31370, which is the serial number of the camera dot local. Um, Either Jeff or Nick, if you have a moment, if you go to our website, there is a blog where I show folks how to link to the Alexa Mini. If you have an opportunity that might be kind of fun to uh, go in and, and have that link for everyone so they could go in and explore that a little bit more. Uh, but again, it's, it's nice to have that control. It's also nice to know that it just exists so you have that confidence um, to be able to troubleshoot stuff quickly and easily. Okay, let's go into control setup and select. Now this is where we're gonna go in and we're going to designate uh, what does what. So let's go to my knob, for example. If I go in there, I have it designated as focus and this is a really great one to know about uh, if you have uh, the reverse direction. So notice what's happening. If you're not familiar with 
focusing systems. Essentially, and everyone comes up with their own way of kind of memorizing this, but this is kind of how I've thought about it forever. If I, when I'm holding my handset like this, or traditional follow focus or mechanical follow focus for that matter, if I turn counterclockwise, meaning let's go into profile here. If I turn this way, it means that I'm focusing away from the camera in this direction. And if I turn this way, I'm focusing with the actor coming towards the camera. Kind of the way that I've always remembered it. Again, everyone's gonna come up with their own little strategy here. So I just pretend that it's like fishing line or a line coming off the bottom of here. And if I spool out, it goes further away. And if I reel it in, it gets closer. So everyone kind of has their strategy. That's how I've always learned it because before I had uh, electronic focuses, I was just on a knob and I had to be watching the actor and then watching him come towards until I pull in or I let it out, bring them in, take them away. So it's kind of the strategy that you can have. Now, that is just so happens to be uh, the way that this works. If I, if I let or go away from the camera, I'm going towards infinity. And notice that it, the direction of this lens does the same thing. There may be situations, depending on how the motors are rigged, uh, depending on the motor position, where this strategy, when you get the, get the handset, doesn't follow this, this pattern, that's when you need to know that you can go into here, go to your motor setup or your control setup, I should say, and have access and be able to change the marker or change the direction, I should say. So important things to know. This, by the way, these, uh, these setups here are very traditional. Our slider is almost always the iris, the stick, almost always zoom, and our knob is our focus. But you could change them for whatever reason. Motor setup, I almost wanted to show this to you first because uh, you might recall when I did the initial calibration, um, we had the, the chatter because the tooth wasn't, uh, the, the gear on the motor wasn't fully engaged with the gear on the lens. That was just a physical thing. You may get into a situation where you need to change the amount of torque that the motor is applying to any given lens. This is uh, a specific, especially true of older lenses because older lenses, if they, especially ones that have not been maintained, are going to start to become the lubricants, the oils that are used inside of them might become more viscous. So the focus, the iris, the zoom rings, they might be, require more pressure in order to activate them. So if you need to change that, you can come in here and you can change your torque setting. Now, right now I have focus on number two. There's a total of four stations in this menu. And you can literally just hit this menu, change. I tend to go with two uh, as my go-to because I find that with modern lenses, that is uh, enough torque to allow the focus to take place. Just for, I'm gonna change this to one, just so you can see. I think it barely has enough to move it. Yeah, it's still, yeah, it's just a little, it's kind of hard to tell for me because there's a delay uh, going out to you guys, but there seems to be just a little bit of lag here. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna change the motor setup. I'm gonna, all right. The reason I bring this up is because you may get into this situation depending on how the motors are uh, built onto your camera, where they, there's so much torque on the motor that when they reach the end of their travel, they literally hop off of the gear because there's just so much inherent torque in that motor. 
uh, this can cause you to have discrepancies in your registration for your focus, your iris, or your zoom. So if you're experiencing that situation, especially if you're on a support rod that's a distance from the camera, you might have a long lens or something like that. Uh, you get into that situation, generally speaking, going in here and changing the torque will help to alleviate that. And it's an important adjustment to know about uh, because it helps to alleviate uh, not only the hassle of that potential skipping, but let's think about the other ramifications of that. If your motor is over torqued and it's applying pressure to the lens, regardless of whether the lens is supported or not, you're now applying energy to that lens uh, that otherwise would not be. And anytime we exert physical energy onto uh, the lens, what happens is that energy is transferred down the lens to the lens mount to the camera. The result of that is that we may get a bump in our image on screen. So in its most uh, uh, extreme uh, situation, we reach the end of a focus and we can literally see it on screen. So having torque control or knowing how to uh, adjust it is really important. Okay, now we're going to get into the biggie here, which is the lens data. The lens data is the go-to menu if we don't have the luxury of the Signature Prime that has all the metadata that's populating our handset for us. This is where we have to go in. And if you're new to this, this is something uh, that's really important to keep in mind in terms of when you are prepping a camera at a rental house or anywhere for that matter. Because keep in mind, what I'm about to show you this has to be done for every single lens that you're going to be using. And that's why these handsets have the capacity to save uh, lens files in them and then move them over to the camera. Because it is a time consuming process and it is something that has to be done and it has to be done absolutely, criti it's absolutely critical. And I'll just kind of give you a little uh, analogy here. Think about, you know, a, a big budget movie that you've seen uh, and you just really appreciated the production value, you, you appreciated all the hard work that went into that movie. And think about what it costs to make that movie. One way to think about the entire budget of that movie was that when that first assistant pulled focus to five feet, it had to be five feet on screen. Because the reality is, if this isn't right, it's not gonna be right on screen. And if it's not right on screen, you notice it immediately. You know, we're very, we're, uh, we're very critical uh, viewers of, of, of different types of entertainment. And literally the look, the effort and the uh, financial wherewithal to make a production happen comes down to this dial. And what this knob here ends up doing to this focus knob or focus ring. So it's a little, uh, it's a little humbling when you, when you think about it that way. Uh, but it also, I think, really reinforces just how important um, this piece of equipment is. And also, maybe you can appreciate how accurate it is and what it takes to design and engineer this equipment to make it work this way. So that being said, <laughs> I'll go into the lens data. We'll start setting up a lens file. So I'm gonna select lens data and we're gonna go into something called lens programming. What lens programming means, literally this is where we're going to create a lens. So I'm gonna go and I'm going to select create lens file. And now it wants to calibrate the motors. So what calibration does, first and foremost, what, it's, what those motors are doing right now is they are rotating, but what they're doing is they are encoding the number of rotations it takes to get from point A to point B. And that is drawing a correlation between the rotation 
of the lens. So let's say a focus, the, the focus on the signature prime, I don't quote me on this, but I'm just gonna say hypothetically, it's like uh, uh, 270 degrees. So what's happened with just that calibration is now there's a correlation between the full rotation of this knob and the 270 degrees of rotation on the focus ring. So now what we're gonna do is we're now going to map these different stations within that rotation that designate stops or in this case, our focus marks. So the WC4 wants to get some questions answered before it goes ahead and starts that work. And it wants to know the brand of lens. So we're gonna go down here and it's an airy, so we'll select that. Next, it wants to know what type. So I'm just gonna put SIG in here for signature. And again, the way that I'm doing this is I'm pushing up and down on the uh, lever here that we would use for zoom. And when I want to select something, I'm going to push in on my red knob right here. Okay, so let's go down and I'm gonna call this S. G and okay. All right, now it wants to know the focal length. We could put a custom in here, but if I toggle down, now it goes through sort of recognized industry focal lengths for different series of lenses. And it's a 47, so I gotta go back up. And it just so happens it has 47, great. Okay, serial number. So generally speaking, uh, different assistants work different ways. They might use just the last three numbers uh, of a serial number of a lens, or they might go by uh, a rental house barcode number. Uh, everybody has different ways of recognizing or distinguishing different lenses. I'm just gonna go in here and just call it 234. Now already, I hope you're starting to appreciate the time it takes to do this. And the reason I'm mentioning that to you guys is because you know this is part of the prep process at a rental house and you need to budget the time to do all this stuff. Okay, so we're gonna click okay because we're gonna use Imperial units. I want to mention that this is one of the things that could be really frustrating. Uh, you could have Imperial set on here and yet your uh, display shows up as metric. And the reason is because there is a menu uh, setting inside the LF as well that designates between imperial and metric. So if you run into this discrepancy uh, that, and it's imperial here, you can go into the menu of the uh, Alexa and change it there and immediately it will re-register itself. Okay, so uh, now we're going to select access. Um, notice zoom is darkened because we don't have a focus or a zoom motor on here. So I'm gonna go to focus and it says go to infinity. So I will set the lens to infinity and I'm going to hit okay. Now it wants to go to my closest focus. Now notice it, it defaulted to two feet as the closest focus. I'm gonna go down here to 18 inches, which is the closest focus on the lens. And I'm doing this with a frame delay and watching a monitor. So <laughs> sorry for it, it looks a little wonky. Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm coming down here. I'm using my zoom lever to find 18 inches. Okay, now I can go through. You may discover that sometimes the presets that this unit comes up with just happen to match the presets on the lens or the scaling on the lens. So in this case, so far so good, bro. And one of the things that makes um, the really sort of high-end cinema lenses one of the feature sets that, aside from the look, of course, uh, one of the things that makes them so desirable to use from a camera assistant's point of view is notice how many focus marks I have here. If you've been using mirrorless camera lenses, you may be noticing that there sure are a lot of marks on here. But they realize with this focal length, 
you may have actors playing to these distances or getting this close to the camera. So you wanna have those reference points. Okay, so there's two six. Is it two six? Uh, one second. Yep, two six and then two nine. All right. So here you go, two six. And I think you're gonna kind of get the get the point here. So at some point, what's gonna happen is it's gonna go from these very close increments and we're gonna start jumping up. But again, as I kind of mentioned earlier, on older lenses, you don't have this luxury. Uh, you're gonna find that the marks are really close together and then might go from like 20 to 40 feet or 10 to 20 feet. And you're trying to, uh, okay, four feet. And that's where that limiter can really kind of make a big difference for you. Okay, notice it's four nine here. So I'm gonna have to toggle up to five feet. Five, six. All right, now we're starting to jump a little bit after eight feet. I think we're gonna start to make a pretty considerable jump here. Uh, and by the way, you first, do have the ability to go in here and edit these if uh, if you need to. Yes. Sure, thanks. Uh, quick question uh, from the audience. Does the, does the WCU4 use linear or nonlinear interpolation between marks? And I guess the upshot is, can, can you skip some marks if you're short on time? If, and, and if they don't, are distances you think you're going to be too often or ever? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Okay, so let's address the linear, nonlinear thing first. Uh, this has become a real buzzword lately. Uh, and essentially, the, what linear versus nonlinear is referring to is the mechanism uh, inside the focus mechanism of a lens itself. So a nonlinear system is going to be, one second, let me just, So basically it's a reference to how the lens is constructed in terms of the housing inside the lens. So the, <clears throat> excuse me, old lenses, the way that the focus mechanism works is that it is a uh, brass on brass and it's very finely threaded. And so when you turn the focus barrel, you're moving those threads and the modern lenses, like I believe this one, I know the Master Prime works this way, is instead of the thread, is is a um, it's a channel where the focus elements move back and forth, and um, so it's a, a nonlinear progression because um, it moves faster or slower depending on where you have your focus set, because the focus marks aren't equally spaced apart, so they have designed the the mechanism inside of there to take that into account. It has no effect on how we set our focus in here. The effect is more in the long-term uh, life of that lens. And what I mean by that is um, anytime you have a mechanical connection, in other words, you have a metal on metal connection, over time, it's going to wear down. So older lenses are going to develop play in them. It's inevitable because you simply have a metal to metal contact surface and it's gonna wear itself out. Now we can uh, go in there. We're, um, 
ABLE is the U.S. service center for a couple of different lens, Cine lens manufacturers. So we have tools in place here where essentially what you do is you go in and what's called lap the threads or, or try to build those threads back up. And then there's a process where we harden that so that uh, we get some functionality back into it. That being said, if it's not addressed, what happens is uh, you may feel a uh, delay between turning the focus barrel and the actual mechanism engaging and moving the focus. Okay, and, uh, so couple, we- A couple other questions, if, if now's a good sure. time. Yeah, um, sure. I guess uh, the one was, I think, essentially answered in, in uh, what you just said, but was about, um, you know, are there lenses that can transmit this data to the uh, to the hand unit directly or that the hand unit may come preloaded with mappings for existing lenses already? Okay, yeah, both, both scenarios are true. Uh, basically, here's how it breaks down. Now, I'm making these comments in reference to ARRI cameras right now. Uh, when, you per when you use lenses such as the signature primes, they have the encoders built into them so the encoders are transmitting the metadata back to the handset as we saw at the beginning of the day. Also, master primes can't transfer metadata as well. There are more lenses that are coming online now that incorporate th this technology or another uh, technology, um, eye technology that Cook has um, made available to other manufacturers. In that case, those lenses are now transmitting data. So you should be able to just hook them on and you will get uh, that information. Alternatively, what has happened with ARI over time is as uh, what they call SUPS or software update packages have become available for different models of Alexas. Frequently what was in there along with some improvements to the camera or updates to the camera were these uh, files for different Zeiss lenses. And so uh, you could go into the ECS menu of those cameras, call up a lens, and now that data was being sent back to the WC4. But what I'm showing you right now is the premise is we do not have lenses like that and we are creating the file manually on our own. If I can chime in real quick to you and to expand on, as Jeff mentioned, I did answer that one question uh, partially in the chat there to expand on my answer a bit. Uh, as Ian's sure, mentioning, thanks. the type of, type of data he's talking about is uh, kind of more of those first parts of the programming he was doing where it's telling things like, what focal length is this lens, uh, you know, all this other, what's the manufacturer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, focus scales on lenses are generally uh, either individual to a lens or very, um, they're varied within a group. Just to give you an example, kind of an entry level set of Zeiss lenses, the CP2s, uh, Zeiss actually recognizes that they have to tune the scales, uh, focus scales of those lenses, uh, but they have kind of a predetermined range of focus scales that will generally fit. So for a given focal length, there's something like 26 different focus scales. If you're ever curious to look at that, if you flip over uh, any Zeiss branded lens, you'll see a little two letter designation on the bottom that tells you which focus scale they're using. Uh, but since there's, that's, not in, that's not encoded uh, or communicated through, you can't just pull up a lens data file that will have all of that information or, and have the, have the focus ring and scale pre-programmed. So this portion of it where he's programming in uh, your scale to make sure that it's accurate to your handset, that's, that's kind of got to be manually done. But as Ian mentioned, uh, if you're all within one uh, manufacturer's ecosystem, you can often get some of that data kind of pre-pulled for you. So you don't have to do all of the work manually, but uh, the programming component, um, that's not transferable at, at, at present. I mean, there may be eventually some lenses that can communicate that. But for example, um, Cook lenses are done by hand. So each one is individual. There is no uh, like generic focus ring, not even a big set of them. It's just each one is actually unique. All right, thanks, Nick. So while you were speaking, I took that opportunity. I ran out of frame and I grabbed a uh, compact prime. And notice what's happening down here. You notice this designation here? So that is a designation that Zeiss has made to fit this particular series of compact prime. So if we had to replace this, uh, our lens technicians would be ordering a 
lens or of, of a focus ring with this letter designation. If you look at any Zeiss lenses like the compacts or the uh, master primes, what have you, if you look closely at the focus barrel, you're gonna see that designation is there. All right, so now that we have this, we finished with our focus. Oh, uh, sorry, real focus. quick, Ian, before we move on, yeah. we just had a, a quick follow-up um, uh, from the question uh, to the previous, to the, for the last one, um, uh, asking about, um, you know, specifically with the interpolation, uh, that's a, an advertised feature of uh, Preston specifically, but a lot of other manufacturers about how they uh, get the focus scale to uh, line up uh, a little bit more accurately when you don't have quite as many marks, like say for instance, when the hand unit's asking for uh, uh, more marks than there are on the lens focus scale. Um, and I, I can jump yeah. in on that one having experience with, with both units, uh, they both do perform that function where you can skip marks. Uh, in fact, they're not necessarily required that you, you get even uh, all the marks on the barrel. You know, as an AC, when I've been pressed for time, uh, you know, I'll frequently grab, you know, I mean, the first few close focus marks, especially are more critical uh, than the ones toward, you know, hyperfocal or infinity. Um, so it's not uncommon workflow at all, especially if you have to create a lens file on set is usually this is the sort of thing you would do in the prep and not while you're under the gun. But uh, yeah, right. the, the WC4 is fully capable of that. If you have to skip marks toward the end, especially, it should still have uh, fairly accurate marks in between. And uh, we're going to look at the Preston. And with Preston, um, one of the unique characteristics of that is that when you do build your file, uh, it asks for 10 uh, points of or 10 focus points, and then it can calculate the rest. OK, so now that we've got that done, I'm going to hit the finish. And focus is completed, okay. And now we can go in and we can do our iris. And let's just do that real quick. So I'm at. Quick, uh, quick question on using um, lenses, say in the, the, in the question, the example was broken on, but I can think of any number of potentially like adapted stills lenses or lenses that have either very few marks written on the barrel or have very short focus throw. Sometimes yeah. only, you know, 40 degrees sure. or something. Um, yeah. Would you use like a blank ring for that and slow the speed down or how would you approach that? Uh, you could use a pre-mark, but keep in mind, you know, even though you have a short throw on the lens barrel itself, you still have the scaling on the, uh, on the knob to accommodate that. Uh, you could do either way, but you're going to be able to scale it out. But here's also the other thing about that is that um, you're going to notice, sorry, I'm trying to do this at the same time. <laughs> um, it's actually a great conversation. If you look at lenses that are from a stills background, you're going to notice that the, also the thickness of the line is going to be a little thicker than what you're going to see on the cinema lenses. And so that's another thing to kind of pay attention to because it's, it's not a slight against the lens. It's just, it was manufactured under different toler tolerances. So you might notice that your reference to where say six feet is uh, might slightly vary with the thickness of that line. And if I can add a little bit onto that too, specifically about sure. um, referencing yeah. the question, asking about making your own marks on those sort of uh, lenses, especially if they're not marked, or as you mentioned, if they actually are still photo lenses where maybe their scales don't even have witness marks for you to line up. Um, the, uh, the thing to keep in mind is they may not be fully accurate uh, or worse consistent. Uh, so sometimes when working with those type of lenses, um, you know, it's not the ideal, uh, situation, but you may have to pull by eye, so to speak, where you're, you're going more off of a reference monitor or something than you are on the witness marks on the lenses. But if the lenses have at least a, a housing with, uh, you know, a geared ring, uh, like some of the Rokinon Cine lenses do, um, it's not uncommon for ACs to just, what I've done a lot in the past is just take a thin piece, maybe a quarter inch piece of paper tape, just wrap it around that scale that Rokinon put on there that I may not consider all that trustworthy, and then just mark out my own scale uh, once the measurements have been taken and I've, and I've checked it using a chart. That's a great point. Thanks, Nick. Because keep in mind the mechanism on that may be in such a way that some of these lenses don't even have a 
uh, mechanical. They have a, a, a motor driven mechanism in there. And by their design, again, because the reference point for the design was for stills applications where people weren't looking at the scale, uh, you may have difficulty even hitting that mark repeatedly, accurately. So uh, that's, a, that's another thing to kind of keep in mind. Arguably using limits is another strategy you could potentially try to use as well. Okay, so we have, um, I'm sorry guys, is there any more questions? Uh, yes, there was uh, about, well, I'll go ahead and let, uh, let Nick uh, present it. I think, you know, having more experience as a first AC, he's probably a better person to do that. Well, I think we both just were about to jump on that at the same time there, Jeff. <laughs> Sorry, we had a question regarding um, mapping the iris. Uh, someone's sharing their personal experience with working with an assistant where they were told uh, that there were issues if you didn't uh, map the iris uh, and that it would cause an issue with working with the iris motor since the mapping was only for a focus motor. I guess I'm not sure, and, and perhaps, uh, uh, John, if you want to uh, elaborate on that a little bit, we can um, go a little bit more in depth on that too, but I'm not aware of a limitation specifically with the WCU4 like that. Uh, one of the nice things about how this system works compared to um, other, uh, other focus pulling systems, uh, especially like the Preston, the Preston motor controller assigns a job to each uh, motor. Uh, and so if you attempt to kind of circumvent that by plugging a motor that you say have lined up with the iris, into the focus port on their on their motor controller, I could see where you could run into some problems uh, with the um, WCU4 uh, and the C Force Mini motor specifically. Uh, Ian could just tap that little button that lit up green in the uh, kind of picture in picture there that shows that's right underneath the FIZ on those motors, uh, and that will change its job, uh, and then it carries the mapping over. So if you've mapped um, focus to, uh, to you know in some way on the hand unit, and then you tell a motor that its job is focus other than the calibration on the lens, it remembers everything else you've done for focus. So uh, at least for this particular system, that shouldn't be a limitation. Yeah, I, I can't see a reason for that because the, the C-Force minis handle all operations uh, and they're highly accurate. So there's, I've never heard of an issue uh, with a motor having an iris uh, issue at all. Okay, so if we're good on questions, I'm going to go ahead and show you the next step. And that is notice that now that I have mapped uh, the focus and the iris, you now see that the save uh, icon is lit up in green. And that's saying essentially, uh, do we want to save this to the SD card? So if I push it one time, it now goes into this mode and says, okay, well, is there anything you want to uh, update or edit before we save this as a file. There's nothing I want to do. So I'm going to push it one more time and it gives us a little icon and I do not want to map another lens. And so now I'm going to calibrate. And off we go. All right, fantastic. So now we're all set and we're ready to go with this lens. I wanna show you just a couple more features in here because uh, the nice thing about this is that it's pretty feature rich in what it can do. And I'm gonna go, go back into the camera and I'm gonna show you uh, there are some user buttons that we could set up to correspond with camera user buttons. And then we also have this, which is kind of interesting, which is the SDI. And what this allows us to do is to assign tasks to the SDI outputs on the camera. Uh, so if we have a camera feed, essentially what happens is uh, we can go in here and what the change command simply means is uh, if I wanted to, I could now hit this change and put peaking on my SDI. I could have an exposure uh, on my camera, uh, things of that nature. Um, I mean, I can plug it in if you guys want to see it, but uh, I can attest that this is really working. Uh, this can be very helpful uh, for so many different circumstances because keep in mind, 
that the camera has two SDI outputs. So we can keep one SDI, uh, what we say is clean, meaning that that's the nice picture that the clients are going to see. And then we have uh, the what we what Aria likes to call processed uh, image, which is the image that it's going to have all the information on it that the technicians on the crew are going to want to see. Um, so having the functionality in here is um, very nice and it makes it incredibly flexible. But again, the important thing to understand about this is that you must have that license installed in order to uh, make all those functions possible. I want to note one more thing on here and that is this little disc right here. And if you push this in, what this is supposed to do, or what it does do, is if I push it in and I turn this, what it will do is it will introduce, you can notice you have sort of this little icon right here. And as I turn it, the idea is that you are going to introduce more resistance to the hand wheel. So if you have to, you, know, you don't want to use limits, but you want to have a very precise movement on your hand grip. You could go in there and introduce this. You just and to deactivate it, uh, you have to turn it, and then you'll feel this plunger kind of go in, and then you can turn it the opposite direction. And now I get a uh, free play on this uh, on the handset or on the the focus knob. Okay, so that pretty much is the uh, feature set on the, the handset and with the motors. Uh, the only thing I didn't really kind of touch on right here was the calibrate button. So at any time uh, that you need to recalibrate, you push it and it's a three to one countdown and then off you go. One other thing I do wanna show you in the menus before we leave here is <clears throat> now that I have that lens data, oh, I'm going to give us the right. I'll go down to lens data, select. And now if I want to do something called a lens file transfer, what it means is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to select the lens. And now what I can do is now I can select it and broadcast that over to the camera. If I didn't have this already in the camera, this file could now be populated in here. This is just one of the tricky things you kind of kind of realize about how the system works. If this file didn't already exist in the camera, I would have to shoot it over to the camera in order to get my data back. If I didn't do this step, when I went to my home screen, my data would be blank. And it's blank because the camera isn't transmitting anything back to me. Um, so if you're building your own files, just remember um, that that is, uh, if, if you encounter, because the natural tendency is you finish the file, you save the file and you go to the home screen and under that circumstances, it's going to be blank until we do that separate step, going in and transferring that in information over to the camera. Once that happens, and typically it will transfer and then ask for a calibration. Once the calibration is done, then the screen will be populated uh, with the data. Okay, so that is uh, the only other thing we really haven't talked about is the battery. And let me just power down so I can pull this out and show it to you. Got a little slider right here that pulls it out. And this is a little lithium N, little Sony. Now, I, I only point this out to you guys because there has been this odd circumstance where I have put off market or other than Sony uh, L batteries into this handset or M battery, I should say. And I got very particular uh, behavior out of the handset. Um, so kind of my rule of thumb about that is to stick with the uh, battery that was designated for it, which is this M battery. Um, it may or may not happen to you, but I've just, it's one of those weird little things where I encountered 
when I used an off-brand, just this really bizarre communication started happening. And as soon as I replaced the battery with one of these, we were all good to go. Okay, so at this point, what I would like to do is I want to uh, switch out cameras. So this might be a great opportunity to take uh, a five minute break and uh, you know, stretch real your quick, legs, uh, what have you. Sorry, real Any quick. Questions? Yeah, there was yeah, just sure. quick, I think it'll be a quick question. What, uh, what kind of battery life would you typically expect uh, on the hand unit with a Sony battery? I would say at least four or five hours. And I'm, I'm a little hesitant to give you a hard number and here's why. These batteries are part of an inventory of a rental house. They get used and abused. Um, so your particular, if you're very diligent with your batteries, uh, you might get six or eight hours out of them. But I basically factor four to five hours. Our kits uh, that we have here come with three batteries as, a, as the starting point. And I would be hard pressed to go through two batteries in, in a 12 hour day. Now, that being said, I am making that statement uh, from uh, Southern California where, you know, it doesn't get cold. So I don't have that factor. I have the other problem, actually. I have excessive heat to deal with, but cold is not one of the issues I have out here. So that will obviously uh, work to my benefit in terms of uh, the cells. In Chicago, you might want to double up those batteries uh, during the fall and winter. I would generally agree with that assessment. It matches my experience. Uh, I will say the WCU4 has generally about a little bit slightly shorter battery life than the Preston. It's probably just due to the fact that you have a big uh, full color screen on the WCU4 and the Preston units just have a, a really basic monochrome display. Yeah. Okay, well, there's no other questions. Uh, let's take a, a short break and I'm gonna reset another camera, another system, and I'll meet you guys back here. Uh, us moderators still be hanging out here, so if you guys uh, do have any other questions, feel free to post them in the chat, and uh, I'll try to type an answer for you while Ian's uh, changing setups. Right, and I, I will agree with uh, the comment that John posed and say that yes, the division of the bars on the battery life scale on the WCU4 can often seem to go from like full to you know like one bar left uh, in the blink of an eye. Um, but that said, I think the overall battery life is typically, you know, pretty good. But certainly keeps spares on hand for all kinds of reasons.
All right, should we get started? Hopefully everyone's back. So what I've done is I've put up the uh, Alexa and I have a Optimo 24 to 290 on here. Uh, this is the newer version with the uh, interchangeable backs on it. And I have the Preston Fizz system on here. I'm gonna go to my phone just so I can show you the close up of these different components so uh, you can get familiar with it. So bear with me, I'm gonna change over to that. All right, so this is the uh, MDR. So the Preston essentially is made up of two components. The MDR, which is where the uh, signals are received and transmitted to and from the handset. This is also the physical connections that go to the motors. So I have uh, just wanna go through a rundown of what you're looking at here and what does what. So at the top, we have a slider switch. We have a, uh, distinction here of operating hardwired or by radio. So we're in our radio uh, mode right now. I pulled the focus motor. All of these connectors are identical. Uh, there are different types of motors. I'll go through those uh, with you in just a moment and kind of give you a breakdown of what is what. They're all digital. Um, one thing that's really nice about Preston systems is that uh, they are color coded for their different functionalities. So the motor cables are going to have these uh, green shrouds and the receptacle for it is gonna have this green uh, spacer around it as well. So let's talk about what we're looking at here. First of all, with zoom focus, this is, or zoom iris and focus. You have a switch down here and it goes blue, yellow, and then red. Uh, what that designates is your different torque settings. So again, we can set this up uh, based on the, amount of torque we need to introduce uh, to the motor. We have that slider switch uh, that allows us to have that functionality. And it's nice just to have it because uh, you know we don't have to go into a menu. We can do it very quickly uh, on set. The other slider switch right here is the one with the white dot next to it. And that is your direction switch. And if you notice right there, they have gone ahead and put the designations right there, so you can see it. We have these uh, Limo connectors for the motor, and then next to it is something called a serial port, and that is used for different uh, applications. It could be an aux position, or uh, what we've done here is I have uh, hooked up a cine tape, which is a cinematography electronics uh, device. The way this works is that um, I'll go to a wide shot when I finish talking about this, but notice it has eight, nine. So it's showing me that the distance uh, from the receiver for the Cine tape to a focus chart that I have is eight feet, nine inches. And we use that as a reference. Just so you know, ARI has um, a corresponding um, uh, piece of equipment to the Cine tape that is uh, meant to work in unison with the WCU-4. And here we're gonna use this. There's also another uh, uh, type of focus display measurement device. Uh, I'll show that to you as well on a, a keynote. That's called a light ranger. But the upshot of this is that we now have a visual uh, distance from the focus plane and we have a uh, cable that is running into, through the serial port, into our MDR, and it is giving us that information on our handset as well, so we can kind of compare and contrast those two. That kind of takes, it, takes care of this side. On the top of the MDR, let me see if I can just undo this so you can see it. And yeah, that was a little awkward, but there we go. On the top of the MDR, we have our channel selects. Now this is an MDR2, yeah, we're up to channel. For, for, sorry, I apologize for breaking in, but it looks like we might have lost the feed to your uh, phone. Okay, thank you. One second, please.
hold on, stand by one second. Sorry for the interruption, guys. Okay. I'll show you the top of the MDR. On the top here, we have the ability to chain our, change the channel. This is a series two. We are now at series four on MDRs. And what has happened with that is they have expand, uh, expanded their range of channels that are available. And the reason why those updates were made was to combat the challenging uh, range of frequency, you know, the amount of frequencies that we now carry on a set and uh, be able to cope with that. There is a command right here. This command is how we hardwire into this unit. So if we needed to, uh, you would use the command cable from the handset. There is a corresponding command receptacle on the handset and then we're hardwired. As a rule, uh, all of the um, rental units that you encounter in the world should have that command cable as part of the equipment. You kind of don't want to not go out without having that cable. Under here is your camera power. And this is power to the unit. So, uh, excuse me, camera cable. So what this camera cable is doing is this is sending information down and on the Alexa, so this is the Alexa Classic, let's say. This, uh, we're going into the three pin uh, in order to give camera start stop. And we're going Limo to Limo to for power on the MDR. And the reset button here is a calibration button. By default, when you power this up, it will give you, uh, the calibration will take place. Okay, so let's, Move down here, get rid of shaky cam. And I want to talk about configuring this a little bit. Okay, let me get, sorry guys, I know this is a little jiggly signal. I might use a different camera, let's see. There we go. I'm gonna cut to a different camera guys, so this is a little easier. Thank you for your patience. do this. There we go. All right, let me get rid of this. And then we can talk about the motors a little bit. So these are the Preston digital motors. You can tell by their construction, these are really beefy and arguably this is why this is one of the uh, most used uh, focus systems in the world. Uh, their reliability is just, um, it's, it's kind of unquestioned. Uh, and this is why uh, a lot of folks who decide to be sort of career first ACs uh, use this equipment. One of the challenges, I just want to talk about this right here, is actually finding uh, or rigging uh, these motors into your setup. There's different uh, mounting systems that you're going to find for these motors, and I'm going to cross one more time. Hey, Ian, uh, are, are you meant to be sharing the picture-in-picture? Uh, -picture, uh, yes, I am. It looks like we're just seeing the webcam right now. My part, pardon me. Better? Looks good now, thank you. All right, thank you, sorry about that. Okay, so I just plugged in the uh, the cable 
for the focus motor so you can see that the calibration is taking place. As I said, the challenge really is just figuring out how to get the space on here uh, to work. Because even on a big lens like this, sometimes uh, getting those uh, motors to line up and to get those gears aligned can be a bit of a challenge. Let me just go a little wider on this so we can see it. Okay. There are gonna be different ways uh, that these motors can be attached or different brackets, I should say. The ones that are on here right now, let me pull this one more time so I can show this to you. If you have not done this before, uh, it is important that you uh, go to our rental house. Hopefully someone maybe owns one and spend a little time getting used to this because uh, you have rosettes on either side and then you have the mounting bracket right here. So by loosening this kip lever, you can change sides on the motor. And these brackets, kind of the challenge here is pre-building this, kind of what I like to do is put the brackets in place first and then put the, bring the motors in and kind of get an, uh, you know, an idea of where everything's going to lie and then engage them and plug them in. Um, even on a big lens like this, like I said, there's a very tight space between here and here. So it's just kind of a matter of uh, physically seeing where everything's going to line up. A quick question uh, from the audience, Ian, while you're doing that. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, one of the attendees noticed that with the Prestons, you went from having the motors on the iris, on the rod, you know, above, uh, to now being uh, mounting the motors on the rod, uh, the rods underneath. Uh, yeah. That, does that matter? Is that just a function of this build versus another camera? It, it literally is just a function of this build because, you know, what I'm doing right now is a big studio setup. And so with that big studio lens or big, you know, studio base plate with this lens of this, it just doesn't make sense to have the motors over slung. Whereas on the mini, I was doing more of a compact build. Uh, so it just made sense to have that freedom, to have that space there to do that. There's a reason I couldn't do it, but do I want to? Uh, I'm not so sure. So I'm gonna go ahead and, oops, one second. To elaborate on that a little bit too from my experiences. Yes. Yeah. It is very build specific, as Ian mentioned. You may have other accessories on the rods, uh, like lens support, uh, you know, or other devices that need to be connected. And so you might be uh, choked for space on the rods. So with that big zoom, obviously Ian's got plenty of uh, rod real estate there. So uh, it just makes sense to not rig extra stuff to the camera if it's not needed. But there are a lot of reasons why you might choose to go one way or another, and it depends on what else you're putting on the camera. Okay, so now I'm going to, so I have this set up right now. Uh, so what I'm gonna, sh okay, let me just line this up. Okay, so let's take a look at what we have here. Uh, the CIDA tape is plugged into the serial port. That is an accessory from Preston that you can purchase and essentially electronic, communication is happening in there in order to make the readout here on the Cine tape possible. So what I'm seeing is a uh, ability to um, see what Cine tape is saying. And at the same time, there's my live feed for what the Preston is seeing. So very, very handy to have that functionality. So let's talk about the feature sets on this and how this is working. Let's just go through uh, top to bottom a little bit. Keep in mind that this is a legacy follow focus system. And what I mean by that is that Preston Cinema Systems started with film cameras. So they still have, they, they, when they design something, they sort of have 
uh, that legacy in mind. So you still have the capability if we had film cameras to see our frames per second and see our footage count if we were using a film camera. We also have the ability, uh, also up here, we can see the channel that we're on right now, channel 23. And you can see the strength of the signal. And you can see we, that we have a fully charged battery. So we've got uh, all that going on, you know, continuously. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is that it's maybe a little hard to see from your perspective, but that character right there is the letter E. And that corresponds to the letter value here. So we have pre-marked scales. Again, you could use a blank scale from Preston, uh, but we have pre-marked scales uh, that we can use from Preston as well. And they are designated by this letter value. Before we go into the menus, uh, the layout on the screen here, camera is your uh, run, start, stop for the camera. You have soft buttons here to go into the menu and then uh, various other attributes. We'll get into that stuff. This is a little tally right here for your camera run. Then you have these S and R for focus, iris, and zoom. So these are your, these are your limiters uh, so that you can limit the travel of focus. Uh, just kind of like what we did with and then once that is illuminated, you now have that, that limit set. And then when you hit R, it restore. So quickly, you can set limits for focus, iris, and zoom. Uh, nice thing is it's right here. You don't have to go into uh, a sub menu to, to find that. The slider right here for iris, a lot of, uh, effort went in to design this in such a way that it's weatherproof. Uh, there's no way for water to seep in behind this. Uh, so this is a really beefy construction. On the back, we have the command. That is where we would do the hardwire connection. And then notice right here, we have a uh, cable coming out and that is going to this, which is called the Microforce Zoom Control. So with the Microforce control, this is a, the series two of the digital. They had analogs before this. This is more of the film days. We have uh, the ability to set stops here, reset, calibrate. We also have a directional switch. It's all directed by a joystick right here. And we can change the value or the speed of that zoom using this knob down here. So as I turn it and your value goes down, the slower your zoom is gonna get. We can make it into just very, very subtle, or if you want to speed it up, you can hit this thing called the zap button right here. And the zap button will, uh, as long as you have the joystick engaged, well then, speed up your zoom. The purpose of that is so that if you are doing a take and you're doing a very slow pull, you finish the take, you need to go back to your start mark, you could quickly reset the zoom to that focal length. Okay. There's a little sensor right here and that sensor affects the brightness of the display. Again, uses M batteries back here. If I don't wanna have the uh, Microforce controller attached to it and make it just a two unit system, um, there is a hand grip that would go into, let me screw this real quick so you can see this. And there's a little channel here. And then we have a hand grip that will go into that and uh, may have a really, uh, would you say like a urethane kind of finish to it. It uh, helps repel, uh, basically 
it stands up to weather and it won't, uh, it's made of material so it won't sl slip out of your hands if your hands are, are sweaty or wet. Okay, so to set up a file with this, now this will remember up to uh, 255 lenses in memory. So you have a main memory. Let's go to your lens menu. Here you have your all lens file. So there's 53 lenses in here right now in the library, but you can take up to 255 lenses in memory. And then you have these things called your my list. My list holds 15 lenses and it's sort of your quick go-to. So you could, for example, if you're setting using a set of super speeds, you could have just the super speeds on that list or uh, your go-to zoom lens, what have you. So go into all lenses. Now you can see it is broken down or designated by manufacturer. So I'm gonna go into Ingenue and I'm navigating using this lever, the series of levers left and right, up, down. And then you also have the button in the center, which takes you into the next level of menu. So Optimo. And you see I have, there's a number of 24 to 290s in here already, and I could call them up, but I could create a new lens. And here, you know, you're just gonna put in your data. And we'll just call it Okay, and we select that. So now, now the big difference here, as we mentioned earlier, so I'm gonna hit infinity, go to next, and now I'm gonna go to my minimum focus. And notice that on the left-hand side, if I turn this to the camera just a little bit better so you can see this. My minimum focus on this is four feet. So I got four feet, but notice I have to go down and I have to choose four feet as my starting point. I choose that now, notice what's happened you get calibration points two of 10. So you have 10 stations and it allows you to go through the lens and you could just basically the next focus is gonna be four two, but my choice is four three, which isn't there. So I'm gonna to go to four six. Select. So arguably it's a little faster to do it this way because you can kind of pick and choose the points of reference for your focus. So I'm just gonna do five feet here. Uh, Ian, careful about leaning in too far. It looks like you're obstructing your uh, overhead cam a bit. Yeah, my, my, my apologies. Uh, you know what I'll do? Since we're finished talking about the, the motor setup, I'm going to push in a little tighter on that camera so you guys can see the focus marks as well. side of this. Okay, so let's 
So now I'm going to choose seven feet and we'll just work our way down. We are at 0.6 of 10. And I'm going to do one more, 10 of 10, and let's do 120. OK, so now that it's all in there, now I can go in and I can go back out. And now I've got my marks. and so on and so forth. So now you've got that file in there, it's in memory. Uh, it can be used uh, at your discretion. Uh, and again, you have a whole um, uh, library of choices that you have in there. Okay, I wanna go in and show you some of the, the motor options that we have for this. Okay, so we're looking at uh, this second generation right now with the MDR2. Again, on the top left is the MDR4, which is the latest uh, version of the handset. Okay, so I wanna show you the Light Ranger and what that is. So this is the MVR three and four. Uh, these are the breakdowns of what the difference between uh, the different models are. So MVR three is, I would argue, the most used uh, MDR in the industry right now, simply because it's a three channel unit. Uh, but we... Hi, Ian. Um, yep. We're, we're, for some reason, we're just seeing the, um... The title and the uh, pictures of the two hand units, but is should other be text? Uh, should other text be showing up on the screen at this point? It should. Let's do it this way. Can you see it better now? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Not sure why I was doing that. So MDR three, MDR four. Big difference between these designations. The MDR three is the workhorse of the industry, simply because it is a four-channel motor driver whereas the MDR4 is a two-channel driver. But there is an HU4 or a hand unit generation 4 available now. Just wanted to jump in real quick with a, a question that we had. Um, yep. Uh, asking if when you calibrate the lens and it doesn't fit perfectly with the ring marks, is there a way to fix it? Um, I guess from my experience, there's a couple of reasons why that could happen. Uh, typically on the pressing units, it would be if uh, you've maybe unintentionally selected the wrong pre-marked ring. Uh, as Ian mentioned, they have that letter designation. And so if your hand unit thinks you're using one ring, but you've actually uh, slipped a different ring onto it, then they generally won't line up. Um, the only other reason that that would happen if you've done all of the other things properly through the calibration and the lens programming for that to not match up would be there's actually a problem with the lens. Uh, it's not uncommon that lenses need to be main, uh, have maintenance done on them to prevent things like um, uh, backlash in the focus ring, which means that if you were to pull focus to a given mark uh, and then come back, especially quickly, it might throw off the lens's internal marking and so that it doesn't hit the same spot consistently every time. So 
Uh, usually, as ACs, we'll describe that issue as by how many how many lines it's off, right? So if we're talking like it's a full line distance off of the mark or more, then that's something that I'm going to ask the rental house technician to have a look at the lens and see if it needs a little bit of maintenance. Again, assuming that I only have that problem on the one lens and not every single lens where it might be a, a, an actual physical issue with the, um, with the uh, lens control system. The other thing uh, that you might want to look for in that situation is if the if you're seeing consistently across all your lenses a focus discrepancy, it may be that the flange focal distance on the camera mount is off, in which case that would have to be readjusted. But if you're going uh, from lens to lens and one is fine, one is not, uh, generally speaking, it's going to be an issue with that particular lens. Or as Nick has noted, uh, it could be uh, the scaling issue. Okay, this is your command cable. Again, uh, all our rental units uh, always come with a command cable just as a uh, fail safe for whatever reason you might need to go hardwired. This is the Light Ranger. This is the Preston. There's now two versions of it. They're in their now second generation. The graphic that you see here might be a little hard to see, but essentially what's happening is what is nice about this is that it is taking the data from the lens and it is calculating your depth of field based on your T-stop, based on your focus mark. So what it will do is it gives you a visual reference as to uh, which of your subjects is in focus and other subjects that are in focus uh, or, or around them, what is the range of acceptable focus before and after your character. And the way that this is established is by, there's that center line, and then you have lines to the right and to the left showing before and after the subject and what the range of focus would be. Now, this uh, is a signal that gets run to the onboard monitor for the first assistant to see. Uh, the other option that you have with this, now the, the intention really of this is to be a companion and a uh, aid to the first AC in order to be pulling their focus and not only to get sharp focus, but to understand what the relationship of the foreground and the background is to a subject. They also have put an autofocus uh, function into this unit, uh, which essentially drives the MDR, which in turn drives the motors. This was never really intended to be a fully uh, automated focus system. Uh, they simply put it in there um, as a convenience. But it's uh, but if you speak to Preston themselves, they'll be uh, they will readily admit that you know it's it's not intended as an autofocus, but an aid to a manual focus with an autofocus feature built into it. So it's a little more uh, bigger image of that. Uh, graphic or the graphic display that you would get with the Light Ranger. These are the different motors. It's sometimes a little confusing to kind of get these. Uh, I see a typo in here. Sorry about that. Uh, what the designations of these different motors are and what they are for. So this is sort of a brief overview of what you would do with DM1 to uh, motors versus the other choices that you have. Um, Nick, any uh, any input you want to give to this in terms of because Nick is a steady cam operator and an instructor. So what's kind of your two cents on the motors from a steady cam point of view? Well, really, from a steady cam point of view, it's um, just not stepping on the toes of the assistants. You know, uh, as a steady cam operator, I'll, I'll carry I'll carry whatever system that they need to get it in good focus. Right? It's uh, just like I wouldn't want them to dictate to me like what type of steady cam rig I'm going to try to use. I'm not going to try to to dictate to them. I know it's not necessarily common across all operators. Some of them uh, can request people use smaller or lighter weight systems. Or I've known plenty of operators to request a uh, camera assistant to mount. A single channel system even if they otherwise would normally put all three channels on there just to uh, keep the weight down uh, mm -hmm. or maybe manage power requirements if they're powering a lot of other accessories or have a high-powered camera that's going to drain batteries 
uh, then they may request a single channel as opposed to that. But I don't find that the individual motors between brands or even models within a given uh, manufacturer's line make a huge difference in terms of balancing or operating the steady cam personally. But uh, you know, mileage may vary. Every operator is a little different. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. So um, I wanted to show you this. This is the uh, this is a graphic of the different scales that you can have. If you uh, one of the interesting things that uh, Preston recommends in terms of the throw on different scales, if you know, for instance, that you are going to not be focusing less than three feet, um, notice that the scale on B, where three feet is, it is at the center of the range of the turn of that handset versus look where three feet is on the scale D. And notice it begins with three feet. So the argument here, or the, the use case, is that let's say you are doing a focus pull from three feet to six feet. Well, look at the range of the turn you have on your uh, focus knob on B versus the range of throw you have on D. And kind of the point here is that by switching over to this other scaling, you now have uh, a far greater range of focus points to reference as you're going from your start to end point. This is kind of an interesting idea that they have um, put out there. Uh, and obviously, more range is better. Uh, the other kind of counter argument to that could be that you could use your limits uh, with scale B and be able to um, use the full turn of the focus knob in that respect. Okay, just did that. Okay, recording, just so you know, you need a separate cable. Most times you need a separate cable for the record on a functionality. So power to the unit and the record function are separate cables. Um, cabling is a uh, definitely something you need to be aware of on Preston units. There are a huge number of different choices for cables uh, available from Preston. The way that the Preston, uh, the way that the nomenclature works for the cables is that they will always be identified uh, as to what they do. So in this case, you see it's DMF or digital microforce to FIDS. And then you see you have this number after uh, the description. So that number 4545 is the catalog number or the product number for this particular cable. Now, one thing we haven't really talked about uh, is cost of these units. We should probably touch on that for just a second. Um, and cables is kind of a good launch point for that because keep in mind if you're going to be using one of these units you may purchase it with the idea of one, if you own a camera, you may buy the cables or have the cables necessary for that particular camera. But by and large, the folks who invest in this system need to adapt to every camera out there. So that could be everything from RED to Sony to Airy to, you know, what have you. The result of that is that the the, the cables that you're going to use between uh, the camera to the MDR uh, are going to change. The motor cables may stay the same. However, the other part of that uh, equation is that you have to think about the physical distance. In other words, where am I going to stage that MDR in relation to those motors? So it could very well be that you have one set of cables for a prime lens and you need a separate set of cables for a uh, zoom lens. So for instance, on this build here, I had to uh, build it in such a way, let me go into the, uh, where do I shot of that? So in other words, we had to calculate the physical distance from here to here 
that distance of this cable, in other words, this one right here, which is my focus, that's the furthest away. So it kind of in a way is dictating how this MDR is gonna be mounted onto this camera. There's a lot of schools of thought of how to do this. This particular mounting was done with a plate that is tied down onto the carry handle. Uh, sometimes that might not be the preference that an AC wants. Uh, sometimes you may want to come off the side here. There are all kinds of different uh, possibilities here. What we've done with this plate is we've literally Velcroed it onto this plate right here. So this plate literally just has Velcro on it. And this made sense. because it made sense for the cable lengths that I had to run for those motors. So the upshot of that is you kind of have to think about that a little bit because uh, it's going to dictate how many cables you're going to need in your kit. And I'm going to say that conservatively, uh, you're looking at an investment of several tens of thousands of dollars to have a working uh, kit. And that might sound like an extraordinary amount of money, and it is a lot of money, but it's kind of the way you want to think about this is these tools that you're investing in are tools that you're going to have for the rest of your career. Um, certainly, you know, the value of it will change over time, but the amount of work you get with this piece of equipment and the reliability factor uh, really uh, are the, the points uh, that are really critical in determining your purchase decisions. The best analogy I can give you is that a friend of ours uh, who's a assistant, does big features, uh, has traveled around the world uh, several times with Michael Bay. Uh, you know, he says, look, here's the deal. I, I fly around the world, I plug it in and it works. End of story. So that is uh, kind of the best uh, kind of advertisement I can give this. It's just, it's tough and it's durable, but you have to take into account that the MDR, the motors, and the handset are just sort of the beginning of the build out for this. And all the cables, not just the motor cables, but the interface cables between the camera and the accessories are also the point that you have to take into account as well. And while I'm wide here, I just want to talk about uh, the Cinetape for a moment and show you how that functions. Let me uh, This unit works is we have a, a sensor up here. Oh, let me set that on the phone. Uh, Ian, it sounds like your headset may have given up on us, so you'll have to probably shout toward the <laughs> webcam mic there. No worries, thank you. All right, so the way this is working is you have this sensor up here. Let me turn it sideways so you can see it. It looks like a pair of binoculars. Okay. And what's happening is, is that I have it pointed at the focus chart and it is sending a signal out. It's receiving a signal on the other one and that's how it is calculating uh, this value that's being displayed. So right now it's telling me it's eight foot 10 inches from the focus plane, which is right here over to the focus chart. So when we do a prep with this, what we have to do is we're going to measure from the focus plane, or the sensor plane, and we're gonna measure out to the chart, and we're gonna see 
to what that distance is. So let me just verify that. And so we're about six feet. Now that I know what my focus is, and again, I would be verifying this either through the viewfinder or looking on my monitor. So now here's the thing. I have six feet on my focus. And I know that's good because I visually checked it uh, and it lines up properly on the focus barrel. Now I need to go in and I need to have this replicate or match what the uh, film or what the scale is showing me on the, uh, on the display here. So it's basically you use this little control knob here and it gives you different um, options in terms of um, if I push down on it, it's going to push and hold. It's going to say film plane. It's going to push and hold. And notice this amber light lights up. And now now I can go in and I'm going to set it for six feet. Now it, I pushed again, and now it's gone into a mode called sensitivity, and you see it's six zero. Basically, the way that this works is that the uh, oops, sorry, I'm not showing you there. There's the value. It goes into values of five. So the higher the value, the more sensitive it is. The lower or less sensitive it is. So it's basically looking for uh, information in terms of how sensitive do you want to make this thing? And it's relative to the movement around. Uh, if I put my hand in front of this. Hi, Ian. Yeah. Um, I apologize, but we're having a lot of trouble hearing, uh, hearing you. Okay. Uh, what I was saying is, essentially, with the controls here, you set the the uh, relationship of the physical placement of this sensor to the focus mark on the lens. And so by using this control over here, I'm able to set that value so it corresponds with the lens. You also have uh, adjustments in there that allow you to change the sensitivity of how well it is constantly sampling and displaying the uh, values for uh, different um, types of action shots or the number of people or objects in a shot. So based on that information, you can set the ses sensitivity accordingly. But the idea here is that you will always have a visual reference. And in this case, because we're using the uh, cable that is coming out of the box into the serial port on the MDR, you now also have that information displayed on your handset. Uh, Ian, is it possible, it was also asked um, if you can make the uh, camera image that we're showing uh, bigger, is there a way to make that the primary shared window? I'm sorry, say it again, please. Uh, your picture in picture, can we make that because uh, right now we're yeah the we're just seeing mostly keynote versus the uh, the small bit and it was just asked by the audience if we could make that bigger. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let me uh, again. I'm sorry. It's a lot of signals to to move around. Let me get a little closer on this so you can see it a little better.
Uh, and yeah, while you're while you're adjusting that, we had a couple other uh, questions come in. Um, it was asked that the these types of ultrasonic uh, measurement devices um, have occasionally cause problems with audio gear, picking up a ticking sound on wireless mics. Uh, they're asking if there's kind of a solution for that problem. Have you ever run into anything like that? I haven't gotten the ticking, but one solution you could uh, try to deploy is on the uh, What I can do is, let me. One thing I can do is there's a shroud that can be placed on the front of this. And what that shroud will do is it extends the physical length of the sensors and it thereby narrows the pattern. So that could be a way of helping to avoid that crossover. Yeah, theoretically, to add on to that, they should be outside of the range of what most mics would be concerned with picking up. Um, so that I, I've never personally run into any issues with that with all the with, and I've worked with both the cine tape uh, and the, the airy version, the uh, UDM, as they call it, the ultrasonic distance measure. And I've, I've never had any complaints from the sound people. But, um, you know, I know that that equipment is generally very sensitive. So it's certainly possible that just about anything could could cause an issue. I find it much more common that we get radio hits just from people having their cell phones on uh, causing issues with wireless mics. So sometimes uh, things that, you know, you may think are coming from one thing, maybe from something else, like it may not even actually be the ultrasonic nature of the uh, device. It could just be its radio communication is walking on, um, walking on the frequencies for the mics too. So yeah, that would be something to consult uh, the audio equipment manufacturer, I would think. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's the breakdown on the uh, UDM. Well, the Cinetic UDM is the uh, equivalent of air. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let's see. Any other questions about the Preston or the yeah, uh, we did. We did have uh, a couple other questions related to the to the cine tape. Does the angle of view of the ultrasonic sensor change accordingly in relation to the lens's angle of view, such as when you zoom in and out? No, it's it's a fixed pattern. And then, uh, does the cine tape? Uh, react to movement or does it decide to return distances of things that are moving over things that are stationary? Uh, that is part of your sensitivity. That's part of your sensitivity adjustment. Uh, sorry, I'm playing with it right now. And um, it's part of sensitivity and it's part of manipulating the, uh, the range of the pickup uh, with the horns. Okay, I'm going to, uh, let's see, pretty much if there's no other questions on this stuff, I think it's a good opportunity to go and uh, swap out back to the uh, mini because I want to show you guys some Bolt stuff. So we, that, did, we did have, I think, kind of one last question, uh, which I think is a good one uh, on the Cinetape, but what is the relationship between the Preston Light Ranger or the Light Ranger 2 and the Cinetape in terms of their use cases? Well, it, it's more of a history thing. Um, the Cinetape has been around for quite some time and there's a couple generations of them out there. It was the first thing that was in existence that did what it did. And the Airy UDM and the uh, Light Ranger are relatively newcomers to that market. Um, I will say that, you know, this the the this the Cinetape has sort of been the go-to for years and years and years um, from cinematography electronics. Um, the Light Ranger is you could think of it as sort of a uh, 
first of all, it's using a visual reference versus just a LED readout for your um, for your distance. Yeah, if I can jump in to add a little bit on that as well. They, the use cases are often uh, very similar. You're using them as a focus assist device, but the best way to think about the CineTape, the UDM from Aerie, the, uh, and um, to other units like maybe the Ward Sniper, which I think, if I remember correctly, uses an infrared laser. Um, they, they, those are all essentially uh, focus assistance devices in that they are a form of uh, somewhat invisible measuring device that you can use while live. Think about it as being able to always just have your measuring tape out all the time and not be in the shot. Uh, versus the Light Ranger can do that function, but is also just a much more advanced uh, kind of depth sensing capability. Uh, and it has an overlay that can go over the monitor uh, to assist. So you can use it as a focus assist device, but it can also be used as an extremely high end uh, sort of cinema version of autofocus as well, since it talks directly to the Preston system and can control their motors. Um, it's a proprietary closed system piece where you can't really use um, where you can't really use, uh, you know, the the Preston Light Ranger system to its fullest extent, or really much at all with other systems of focus units, because they're not going to have the communication protocols, or not going to be able to link up the motors directly like they can in their environment. So it's kind of their next generation thing, as Ian had mentioned, uh, and it allows them to move beyond just giving you uh, kind of a a, a readout uh, of the distance. It actually um, can be a little bit more advanced than that. Yeah, if you guys can see this visual. Um, this is kind of the, the best way to think about it. I know the graphic isn't that great, but really where this uh, diff it distinguishes itself from the other two uh, is that you could say that the UDM and the CineTape are sort of very much in the moment kind of devices. Uh, I mean, they're giving a very literal uh, display of what you have put the sensor towards and seen. The argument for the Light Ranger is that it has the nuance and the subtlety that mimics the focus characteristics of any given lens which you're using. So where would that play out? Well, let's say this shot right here, if we need to rack focus from uh, the subject in the background who's in focus right now with the green uh, bars, and the subject in the foreground, we have a visual reference of where they are and what their focus relationship is to the background character. Now on a highly technical level, we can just say, okay, we can detect with the white bars what it's, you know, how close to acceptable focus they are in relationship to the subject in the background. But where this really kind of excels is if you think this narratively, what is the relationship going on between these two characters? And how is my focus pull going to help tell that story or emphasize that moment? And so by having that subtlety, and also let's introduce the other part of the uh, wild card of the shot is this actor never hits their mark. So he has hit his mark in a different spot every single take. By having this visual grid here, that's fine if they don't hit their marks because you know what? I know when I pull focus, I can visually uh, tell that I've nailed it. You know, it's, it's, uh, to me, it's a, it's a great narrative storytelling assistance aid. And it's also a great technical piece of equipment uh, because, you know, think about when you think about critical focus, the only other camera that I can think of that really gives you uh, a deep level of sort of it's either in focus or it's not is you could think about like edge focus, for example, in a red camera. Now with that technology, when your contrast value photo site to photo site is on the highest level of contrast, that's when you see that image in focus on the display. But everything else is gonna be out. So in a way, if you were trying to pull off that same type of focus routine, you're gonna be sort of in this 
literal black hole between the foreground and the background, whereas this, you see the subtlety of what can be and what definitely is in focus, if that, if that makes sense. So kind of, you know, the airy product, stereotypy electronics product is very in the moment sort of stuff. This gives you a greater level of depth to determine focus uh, and to tell the story. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. All right. So what I want to do is uh, let's take uh, let's take another five minute break, and I'm going to reset, and then we will look at um, uh, look at the bolt stuff, the Teradex stuff. And also, I just want to touch on a few uh, little points uh, about the Alexa LF and uh, some of the wireless technology in there as well, and some options for it. All right, so uh, let's take a quick break, and then we'll reset, and we'll be right back.
Okay, guys, I'm back. Thanks for your patience. Okay, so we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at the Teradek stuff. Uh, we have a Teradek bolt up on the uh, Alexa Mini LF. I'll show you that on the camera here. All right, so pretty straightforward piece of gear. Um, I have it mounted and we have a power switch over here. Let me, uh, okay, so your main power switch is right here. You have your power and your transmitting status buttons right here. And the button that you want to know the most is going to sound crazy, but one of the most important pieces of gear you can have in your kit when you're working with this, believe it or not, is a paper clip. Here's my paper clip. The reason why it's so important is because right there, that little button right there, uh, well, Riddell, I'll show you a close up of that. So, what that is doing is that is sending out a mode. Well, it's two modes actually in there. If you hold down on it for 15 to 30 seconds, it's basically going to reset the entire unit. Uh, so, then you can go in and pair uh, with the receiver. So, what I've done is I've hit that switch. I have all my statuses here. So, I'm good to go. I have a two pin limo right here. And I'm using a two pin limo on the breakout box on my LF to power it. And then I've got my BNC going into the input right here. And this always is confusing because the output is the top one. So now that's transmitting. And that transmission is going to This guy right here. So this is a Bolt 3000. And as the name implies, you know, the cost point of these goes up with the number because it implies and tells you what the range of this is. Now on the 3000 and higher units, the receiver has this really handy LCD window. And what that allow you to do is go in and you have a menu. So you can change formats. Uh, you can apply a lot. So for instance, uh, I have the LF set up so it is outputting log. If I wanted to, I could go into the preset here. And sorry, go back. And back in here, sorry. To, okay. And I could do a 3D preset. And notice one of my choices here is Alexa, Log C Direct 709. Then there's Black Magic, Black and White, Fuji, uh, sort of the film emulsion emulating emulation LUTs are in here. But if all you want to do is just put on something really simple, you have the ability to do that. It also has a spectrum analyzer, which is nice because it's going to go through and look at the area you're in and kind of tell you uh, where your setting is right now and where uh, you could be optimized. And then channel selection, pattern, pairing, on it goes. Um, the main thing I want to emphasize with this is sort of the troubleshooting aspect of it. Most of the time, um, and Nick, pipe in uh, if you want to add to this, please. But kind of from my experience, the main culprits here are either a discrepancy in firmware or uh, you just simply have to hold in that, that reset button, let it clear, and then you can pair it again. A great way to know what the status on this receiver is, is to use a software uh, package that's a free download from uh, Teradek. Let me uh, go to it here. It's called a Bolt Manager. I now have this plugged in by a USB cable. And here you can see the Bolt Manager active. And it tells me exactly what I have here. 
the serial number. And what's really handy about this is if you go to the um, upgrade. So if I choose Bolt, this isn't the 4K version, and I can download from the web or I can download from the PC. Because I am connected to the web right now, I can go in and it's going to do the download and it's going to find the appropriate firmware for this. Now, you could go in here and just start the update, but it's better to go to advanced options. Also, notice the version it's displaying. So notice in advanced options, it's going to each of the particular potential updates and it's visually showing you what's updated. This is really handy because there may be simply one aspect of a uh, receiver or transmitter that needs to be updated rather than the whole thing. And so it allows you to select those uh, specific things. If I literally just check that off, uh, it allows you to do the update. So it's a nice way to uh, be able to see quickly uh, you know, what the status is and what it needs to be. I've found that just if I've had trouble doing a firmware update allows me to uh, pretty much alleviate uh, issues that I've had with the transmitter. Okay, so again, you have and you have your status, and we know what our range is, and we know also what the type of video that we have coming out of here. So the nice thing about the upper range of these is that they will give you uh, this visual status and tell you uh, what uh, you have going on. There's also uh, controls in the menu where you can have certain items displayed. Uh, you can tell it to go to sleep uh, if there's no activity. Uh, there's all types of feature functionality that's built into this. The second thing that I wanted to kind of add to that conversation is viewing options. So we can take this out to you know a monitor and we can have that uh, have that signal run into a production monitor. But I wanted to show you arguably what one of the most popular options out on the market today is, and that is this monitor right here. This is the small HD Bolt 703. So what is happening in here is that you have a small HD 703, so that's a seven inch diagonal screen, but notice that it now has these receptacles for the antennas, and built into the back, it has the receiver. And the way that this has, the way that this works is that if you go into your menu selection, you can use this little joystick up here. And you go back and you go into settings. And one of those settings is the wireless settings. So you can see right now, that I am paired to Region USA, and I have my pairing information right here. If I expand on this or select it, you can see that I have it paired, but it it's asking, do you want to unpair? So the advantage of this is that you have the ability to uh, you know, if this shows up on set, you can quickly and easily go in and pair it with your transmitter, and you can have uh, a number of these running around on set. Real quickly, if you're not familiar with the small HD, the, one of the reasons why this is so popular is because what this allows you to do is to uh, have these function keys installed it also gives you the ability to go in and add tools to a page. So if I go in here, you have a whole uh, different, you have a whole set of tools that you can go in and add 
and custom make each different page. So you dual view, uh, you can add in um, exposure, you can add in focus aids, uh, thing, all the things of that nature. And that is kind of why this is being, uh, this has become such a popular unit, unit. and it uses a, uh, a gold mount battery on the back. Okay, so those are kind of the onset uh, solutions. I do want to mention uh, something that Ari has introduced because we're all in this situation where we're having to start uh, well, the Midwest is a little different because I think you guys have gone back into production as of last week. Uh, on the West Coast, we're very slow to kind of uh, get back into the into the grind, but uh, we are showing signs of, of production and activity out here. But we've also had to address the uh, issues of being able to work remotely or distanced. And to that end, I want to make you aware of something that Ari has. And this is called the ERM 2400 uh, LCS. And what this does is this allows me to have items such as uh, the WCU4 or other wireless controls, and we can have them separated from the camera at over a distance of 3,000 feet. And so essentially what happens is you wire into one and then go into the another so we'd have one of these uh, at the camera or near the camera with a cable plugged into it between the camera and the transmitter. The receiver would take a cable from the receiver to the WCU4. And this gives us uh, the ability to control the camera from, as I said, over 3,000 feet away. So this is, uh, gives us the ability to do that distancing and be able to do our jobs. In conjunction with that, we could also go in and we could break out the different axes into different controls. So for instance, this is called an SXU1. This is a single channel control. Uh, we could use this uh, in order to uh, control one of the axes. So we could do, for instance, we could do the iris uh, with just this and then use the WCU4 for focus and zoom. So we have those functionalities. There is the possibility within the ARI family to go in and control the camera over ethernet as well. Uh, we, we are working on different technologies that will allow us, uh, for instance, to be, uh, have the camera in one city and control it in another city. Uh, so all those technologies are starting to uh, be implemented, take place, and uh, ask you to stay tuned because we're going to have more on that type of uh, production environment and different solutions for it coming up very shortly. Um, so that will be exciting to uh, share with you and to see what the capabilities are um, for those of us in different sections of the world and in the country where we still are practicing uh, social distancing and all the uh, safeguards that we need to have to work safely on set. All right, that's going to uh, take us to the end of our day today. Uh, are there any questions? Well, uh, while people are, are gathering their thoughts, I just wanted to you know, let everyone know in, in case you want to, uh, you know, uh, see what else uh, Able City is up to. Uh, we have uh, an event tomorrow, uh, which is uh, part of our Creative Forces series, which is a, a series of online live streamed conversations with filmmakers. Uh, tomorrow, it's uh, met, uh, uh, we'll be in conversation with Benedict Spence, who is the DP on uh, Emmy. Emmy nominated DP for uh, the Netflix show, The End of the Effing World. <laughs> and then uh, also I wanted to highlight that uh, towards the end of September, we'll be doing a couple of two day um, boot camp, cinematography boot camp classes taught by 
um, Leland Crane, who is a, a very established DP in the New York area. Um, uh, one will be called Camera Placement and Movement for Storytelling, and the other will be Lighting for Storytelling. And those are all available on our website if you'd like to check them out. Uh, and the event tomorrow uh, starts at um, 4 p.m. Central Time, if you want to check it out. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff. Okay, let me uh, switch angles here. All right, well, that concludes our, uh, our talk today on wireless solutions. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please keep in touch. Uh, Jeff and uh, Nick, have you put our contacts in the chat? I'm doing that right now, actually. Oh, fantastic. So if there's, uh, there always is something that uh, comes up after the fact, something, a uh, thought, an idea, please stay in touch with us. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, get to those questions. And thanks so much for being a part of our uh, class today. Please stay safe and we look forward to seeing you soon.